And it took, it took a few weeks to work out, a few weeks to months to work out how could it work? How could I do both? Um, and I did think about the possibility of, you know, do I leave medicine full time? And I was, I was given some good advice that, you know, don't, don't leave fully. But I thought, okay, so then if I'm not leaving fully, how am I going to make this work? Welcome to today's episode featuring Dr. Nushin Barmania, who is a consultant, respiratory physician and strategy advisor in healthcare and medtech. So why are we actually doing this episode, which focuses on finding health tech opportunities when you are a busy, busy, busy doctor on the ward or in your clinical practice, and you don't really have as much time as you would like to really uncover some of these opportunities, as we know, are not readily available on the market. So today, I'm, I'm really, really excited to share with you Nushin's story about how, as a respiratory consultant, she managed to bag her way into a med tech company as a chief medical officer. Uh, so basically, we're going to be focusing on why she was actually exploring alternative career options, um, how she managed to essentially create this opportunity for herself through connections she made in a quality improvement project she did in her trust, and also understanding the value that she brought to the, the startup world as a doctor, as a consultant, as a fanatic of health tech, and the advice that she offers doctors who are in a similar position. I think especially doctors who are further down the career pathway, they feel that their time is over, like their opportunities are gone and no one wants consultants. But that is definitely, definitely not the case. Um, It's not just about junior doctors. It's about you as an individual and the value that you have to bring to the company or the opportunity that is most likely going to be right on your doorstep. So have a listen. I hope you find it valuable. And before you do so, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. Uh, We are on a mission and we want you to ensure that you're part of it, but also that you share it with as many doctors across the world. Join our mission at medicfootprints.org forward slash join our mission and stay in touch with us and leave a review, a great review by that. If you're not going to leave a great review, don't leave one at all. All right, on to the podcast. Let's face it, burnout amongst doctors is sky high and we're actively seeking other ways to make the most of our transferable skills beyond the usual career pathways. Welcome to Disrupting Doctors Careers. I'm your host, Dr. Abena Bubbers jones and I'm on a mission to connect one million doctors across the world with the best in diverse career opportunities. Welcome, Nushin, to Disrupting Doctors Careers. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me on as a guest. Awesome. I mean, like, you have such a valuable story to tell with our community of doctors today. And as you know, we are today we are going to be discussing something that comes up quite a lot. So as a doctor, especially if you're working full time in clinical practice, particularly if you're in NHS, and if you're looking to move into health tech or any other sector, you're busy, you're on call, you know, you give more, you you give most of your time out. So how do you make that move? And how do you find those those opportunities? So I've spoken about in previous episodes is that you really need to focus on the networking and the building your brand, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is it takes time. And especially when you're poor for time, like most doctors are, like how can you find these opportunities? And so one of the reasons why, uh, we're featuring Nushin today, who is a respiratory consultant and health tech advisor, um, is that one of her first roles in health tech was as a chief medical officer for a med tech company. 
And so the, the question we're focusing on today is how do we spot and seize health tech opportunities when we're in full-time NHS practice. One of the great things about Nushin's story is that she did not have to go far to find this opportunity. She did not have to leave the ward to find this opportunity. It was right in front of her. And the reality is a lot of these opportunities are on your doorstep. So her story will definitely kind of illustrate like how you just need to keep your eyes open and your focus to really nab them when they're there. Because as I mentioned, and, and especially one of my previous episodes, is that the best door is the back door <laughs> to find these opportunities, the VIP door, because there's hardly any competition. Um, so anyway, let's talk about that. So welcome, Lucian. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was a very long intro, but it kind of gives context as to why this is such an important episode. So do you want to give us a... So obviously you are a respiratory consultant um so top of your game as a doctor when fantastic and congratulations because you know how much it takes to get to that level um but tell us a bit more about why you decided to start considering like alternative careers or other career paths beyond the day-to-day clinical practice well if if we if I start I was coming towards the end of my clinical training so I'm trained in respiratory medicine as well as general medicine, I also CCT'd in intensive care medicine. So I did a lot of quite grueling clinical training. And I think I was already questioning other things that were out there. And that's when we first met, when you were beginning your medic footprints journey. And I remember coming to several of your events in the very early days and hearing about all of the different things that were out there. And, it, you know, having portfolio careers at that point and exploring was not at all a traditional route. So I was really intrigued by the possibilities at that point. And I had it in the back of my mind that that might be something I would come back to at some point. Um, I finished my training and I uh, was lucky to secure a consultant post. Um, so then I began on this, this clinical trajectory of you know, becoming a, you know, a solid consultant in medicine. Um, But within, I suppose, within a short space of time, maybe a year or so, I started being interested and curious in other things. And one of the things that I was doing in my respiratory work was um, looking at service development and looking at how we can improve the particular service that I was working in. Um, And that involved various things. It involved looking at patient length of stay. It involved looking at updating some of the specialist equipment that we needed. And it was through that that I um, began, I suppose, project managing a a quality improvement type project. Um, And this this involved liaising with the IT team, medical device companies, clinical biochemistry. And also through that, I um, got to know uh, a CEO of a small European company that had some software that we were interested in trialing. And it was as a result of that, I wasn't specifically looking for a job at that point I wasn't even specifically looking to network but I I had a a real curiosity and I I was quite exhilarated at organizing this project and trying to make things happen so that was that that happened around during 2017 so I'd been a consultant for 18 months at that point Um, and it was through conversations that I'd had um, with, the, with the CEO of the, the, the software company that I began to wonder, could, could, I have, could I have a role in a more commercial setting? And as I said, I'd been to some of your events. I'd been to um, several events organized by Enterprise Nation. And I think Dr. Preneurs were starting off as well in those days. So I was certainly aware that there was potential for other things and perhaps being a very traditional NHS consultant might not suit me long term. So then it was early February, it was about February 2018 where I I I suppose I plucked up the courage to chat to the CEO that I was I got to know quite well and we got on really well. And I I I just said to him that you know I think I'm I might have an you know I might have an aptitude in something commercial but I don't know because I've never tried I've only ever been a clinical doctor and 
I have no idea if this is something that I would be able to um, navigate, but, you know, how, how would I go about, you know, finding an opportunity? And I think I'd, I'd, I'd said to him, look, do you have, do you have any funds? Can you, can you take me on to do something? <laughs> I mean, I just want to stop you there. Thank you so much for that, for that, for that journey. And, and, uh, and also, I, I think it's really fascinating about the fact that illustrates that, you know, you had an existing project in the scope of your own clinical practice and QI projects are a really good source for these kind of things, especially when there are external providers or external companies that come in and, and collaborate. Uh, but also, you know, you built a relationship with this person, a working relationship. And so the conversation wasn't off the bat transactional because you'd gotten to know them over a period of time. And then you got to a point whereby you were like, hey, you know, you actually put it out there. It's not like you could say, I've got this job. Do you want it? Right. It was you that made that first, that planted that first seed. Is that, is that correct? That's exactly it. And I, I, you know, I felt, I felt a bit foolish. I thought, you know, mm. is what, what will be the response? Um, and it was, it was several conversations that I'd had with him. And as I said, he, at that point, he wasn't in a position to offer me anything that certainly would, you know, uh, would be paid but as a result of that conversation that led on to a conversation he had with somebody else um, and as it happened they were looking for um, they weren't looking for a chief medical officer that the company that I joined they were looking for a research nurse or a research fellow full-time to uh, oversee and have a, a UK base for two clinical trials that were running here in, in the UK, predominantly in London, which was to do with machine learning and AI in the ICU in relation to patients who are mechanically ventilated. So when I heard that, having done my clinical training in respiratory medicine and intensive care, as well as general medicine, I thought, well, this is an amazing opportunity. You know, this is something that can use all of the, the clinical skills that I worked so hard to to get under my belt and I can you know be involved in some clinical trials and and I knew that this was going to be an exciting new area in the future so there were several conversations with the the, the you know the, the the friend I met from you know the CEO and also with the other company that I was introduced to and it took it took a few weeks to work out a few weeks to months to work out how could it work how could I do both? Um, and I did think about the possibility of, you know, do I leave medicine full time? And I was, I was given some good advice that, you know, don't, don't leave fully. But I thought, okay, so then if I'm not leaving fully, how am I going to make this work? So I did a lot of thinking on my own. And I was fortunate in that the company I joined um, accepted that you know I had commitments and responsibilities as a consultant and it was valuable to them that I was in the NHS and they were happy to consider me on a part-time consultancy basis and then I spoke to my clinical lead and clinical director um, at the time in medicine and they were so supportive and I think that was the that was the absolute turning point to know that I had complete support from my, you know, my clinical seniors and, and also a recognition that I needed to have a different type of challenge for my progression, not just professionally, but also personally. So I think with, with that backing, I, 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 was, I felt empowered to be able to make a bold move. And it was brave. I was told by several people, it's quite brave what you're doing. And I remember thinking to myself, well, it's it's not really because this this could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and actually, as it happened, the company I joined were I think they were about to advertise for a research nurse or a research fellow. But because I had um, come along and I, you know, I, I was a, a consultant, they, they asked me, they said, well, we'd like to offer you this role as a chief medical officer. So. I mean, I think that's fantastic, Nisha. I'm sorry to interrupt. I mean, I think I think that's so great how you managed to essentially create your own opportunity. 
because as you said like they hadn't even advertised for this research nurse role but knowing you knowing the value that you could bring as a doctor and then actually I wanted to kind of go into that why, why they decided against going ahead with the research n- nurse role which I assume they decided for ex- for actually you can tell us why they decided to do that why they were looking for a research nurse and not a doctor in the first place and what was it in particular with you and the value that you could bring to the company is why they chose to go ahead with you because obviously another illustration of the story is that there weren't there wasn't any competition here because you created that opportunity for yourself right so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts around that so why not why did they decide not to get why did they want a research nurse initially from what you know and why did they then decide to move to CMO posts understanding the value that you brought yeah I think I I think for, for, for many of these roles it's more realistic to find a full-time research fellow perhaps earlier on in their career or a research nurse and there are you know maybe now there are more but I think at that time that, that you know it's certainly not the norm for an NHS consultant to have a portfolio career in the same way that, for example, gen- general practitioners do. So I think being able to say, yes, I am a consultant, I can commit to you, you know, three days a week because I have other um, commitments in the NHS was helpful. And when it came to the liaison, I did and interactions with the other hospitals. There were several hospitals in London I was uh, interacting with and also in Europe, I think, um, being a consultant with an intensive care training background meant that there was a, a, a common language which gave me a head start. And I mean, not to say that a research fellow or a research nurse wouldn't have had that, but I think I was also just quite bold and quite brave that I have to take this opportunity and I don't want to look back and regret not, not trying something. Um, but it took from the first conversations which were February 2018 it took a few months and I gave three months notice negotiated you know doing um, you know having a reduction in the amount of on calls I was doing you know I'm doing a lot of on calls in acute medicine negotiating as well my respiratory clinic so there was there was that to consider but it it worked out reasonably okay and then I, I started that role in August 2018. So well, I think that's point. and I was gonna say I think it's also really positive that you got the the full backing from your clinical supervisors or decision makers, I should say, because I, I'm certain that in you know in a lot of circumstances doctors will worry that they won't get that or it won't be as as welcomed as you know as per your experience. So I mean, did you at any point in time in that process get any pushback? Um, from your your clinical team or operations team within the hospital or was it fairly straightforward because obviously you had to go through that negotiation process yeah um, and you never know because obviously stepping into another role um, or reducing your hours it's always a risk and you there don't want to be risk. the person that fails because <laughs> we're doctors we don't fail um, so so yeah I'd love to hear a little bit more about that as, as I said, uh, the, mm. the clinical director and the clinical lead and the, the general manager at the time for the department that I was working in, in fact, still work in, it, it, it wasn't a problem. It was facilitated very smoothly. And I think because the role I was taking on was so, so well allied with my, my clinical experience, it, it was, I don't know, it, it didn't... What, what was the benefit for them? Because, you know, one, one of the biggest concerns at the moment in the NHS is staffing. Yeah. So losing your hours and your time isn't great for their service delivery. Yes. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, I mean, obviously this was a few years ago now, a different scenario, but still, like, what was the value for your trust at the time? Yes. And you're, I know you're getting into that. You're, you're absolutely right. It was a different time and I, I, I don't know if, that would be accommodated quite so easily now um, but certainly the the department that I'm in has a lot of part-time consultants who have other roles so I wasn't setting a precedent from that point of view because there was you know there's already you know one colleague I can think of who who you know had a similar setup doing doing other things and actually 
what my my clinical director when I had my appraisal I think not long after I had started the job he he commented that I was so much happier and actually that was that was a benefit to the department that having I think having you know having having a having a colleague who's doing something else in working in another area you know having can only add to the diversity and experience of the department and as I said I think ha having the support from from my my clinical director I think made all of the difference at the time because I I felt I felt I could make a brave decision um and and, and they were surprised but it there was no I certainly wasn't talked out of it mm, I mean I think that's really positive and fantastic and so, I mean, did they did they negotiate a specific time frame where you could take that time out or was it kind of open ended? Well, I gave three months notice in terms of me reducing my on call commitments and my clinic commitments. And we it, it was a it was a you know, it was my new normal, I suppose, from then on. Mm hmm. OK, great. And then I'm moving on to the role itself. Um, so from what I understand, this company um, specialised also in machine learning and AI. Exactly. So can, can you tell us a bit more about yeah the overarching um, technology that you were exposed to and what your role, your value add was as a doctor for this particular company? So I, I had, when I'd heard about this device that they were um, undertaking clinical trials with, I was really interested because it was using as you said, machine learning and artificial intelligence in a clinical setting. And it was a clinical setting I could understand. I could immediately see what the applications were for this product. And the clinical trials were looking at patients who are mechanically ventilated in the ICU. So having had that experience during my intensive care medicine training, I, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I, you know, I was so curious about it from my clinical background that I suppose that enthusiasm and you know, genuine interest in it perhaps was what sold me to the company. And it's certainly what sold the company to me and the interest in the device. And one of the, you know, one of the really nice things as well was going back into, into a, a field of medicine I had been in, but I had left where it meant I also began interacting with some new colleagues, but also some colleagues who I had known from the past. So that was also very helpful um, for the company in terms of helping to galvanize uh, how, the, how the research study went and you know, all the other things that were involved from the machine learning and the AI point of view. Um, you know, I wasn't involved in developing the machine learning or the AI because the engineers were doing that and that, that was, you know, very, very specialist, but it was certainly, my role was to see what's the application of this? How can it be used in a clinical setting? How can it help a patient? And, you know, how can it help the, the clinical practitioner at the bedside, you know, the ICU nurse or the, you know, the doctor who's trying to ventilate a difficult, difficult, you know, difficult patient with ARDS, for example, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, how, how many clinicians did they actually have in the company? I was the I was the only clinician that was part of the company. There were clinicians in, involved um, in relation to the the studies and the, the clinical trials that they were undertaking. But I joined, you know, it was a small company, small startup. So I joined a team of seven who were all based in Europe. And I was the only person here in the UK at a time when remote working wasn't you know, it wasn't so well set up mm -hmm. as it is now. So that was that was a novel experience. Great. I mean, so so what was it like, obviously, being the only clinician in the company, um, the only clinician in the village kind of thing? Uh, yeah, what was it like coming in with your your medical expertise and like how how and like how was it interacting? Because obviously it's a health tech startup, and as we know, a lot of health tech startups don't actually have any clinical leadership. So was did you find yourself as a CMO kind of taking things back to basics for them? Because obviously they, they were based on, they were working on clinical trials as well. So yeah. I'm just trying to kind of understand a little bit more about, again, that, that value add being the only clinician in the company, in a health tech company. So primarily I did a lot when I, when I started. So there was a learning curve for me to understand mm. The device it was very technical and you know i had to understand the device and how it worked to be able to explain it to somebody else 
Um, and that's always the best way to learn. So I had, there was a, a learning curve where I had to teach myself and understand how am I going to explain this to someone else? How am I going to explain to, you know, an, an intensivist at another hospital, how, how being involved in this trial and how this device could potentially help them? I, I felt that my role became taking the information that they had, the raw information, and I understood the application of it. I understood how, how beneficial it could be. And then almost translating it into a way that could be used in an NHS setting in a way that would um, be understood as a, a clinical language in a, you know, aside from a theoretical concept, this is, you know, these are the applications of machine learning and AI. Actually, how, how is this relevant? when you're at the bedside and this device is attached to a patient, how is this relevant? How can this help you? What is the impact of this? Uh, and, and perhaps also in a, in a, you know, from the more commercial side of things, you know, what, what are the benefits to using this in the future? If this was, you know, was to be launched on, you know, on sale, you know, why, why would, why would you use this? I'd love to, I mean, I think that's really interesting. So I would also love to hear, obviously, had they gone ahead with the research nurse role, do you think there would have been a huge gap in their approach, their knowledge from a clinical perspective and also, you know, how to actually sell to NHS and other uh, healthcare providers had they not engaged with someone like yourself as part of their team? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know is the answer. I mean, there were many research nurses involved in the study at the different um, trial centres who were, you know, they were really experienced and very knowledgeable. But I think having, having somebody who is perhaps having, having, a, having a clinician, I think, does help. Perhaps having, I think, because I had exposure to so many different uh, trial centres, and having that overview, I think, was quite helpful. So I was, you know, it wasn't just one trial centre. I, I was involved in um, recruiting additional uh, hospitals and additional units and delivering training elsewhere. And that was that was that was quite an interesting juxtaposition. Being able to talk about, you know, how a, a trial delivery is working somewhere else at a new center and the things that have been learnt and what can be shared etc um I'm, i mean I, I think anyone can be trained and can gain experience in doing anything and uh, you know i it was fortuitous that i i made contact with the, the company at the time when they needed someone mm. and how important was your network your existing personal network in so what two questions how important was your existing personal healthcare network in this role and how important was it that you were a consultant so that the, the level of medical expertise you brought to this role? The, the existing network, I suppose, when I was exposed to the ICU community, that was reconnecting with some people I, I had known in my previous network, as I said. So there were some new contacts and some old contacts that I had. I, th I think being being a consultant certainly is helpful when trying to you know promote a clinical commercial project. I think having having that behind me was certainly helpful, and I think having having you know my my clinical hat on probably meant that I you know I got responses a bit faster, perhaps. I think that was the that was the feedback I got. But it can be it can be quite difficult for for the health tech com uh, companies to tap in to the NHS and the, the you know the clinical yeah. side of things without having you know having a doorway to open. Especially when we talk about the med the med tech regulatory side, and we know how important, especially now with DTAC, which is this NHS regulatory procurement thing I can't pretend to know a lot about this uh, but it's so important that every company that's looking to work or provide um, to the NHS they need to have a clinical officer um, so I'm not sure how present that was in a few years back but now there's a lot more emphasis on it um, so 
you know, you being there as a doctor in particular, I know they talk about clinicians, but as a doctor, from what I understand, kind of really, apart from the, the value adds you provide through your knowledge, your networks, your transferable skills, your analytical skills, your research skills, et cetera, et cetera, there is this added stamp of credibility. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Immediate tick box credibility of a, do- of a consultant is 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 at the forefront of these conversations for this product it must be a, a reasonably decent product because we know that doctors don't endorse things they don't think work or believe in I mean what are your thoughts about that uh, totally and I think with you know with any um with any field that you're you know one is stepping into outside of your clinical role you know by the association the endorsement that that that's given isn't it because you know as you said I, I wouldn't have taken on the role if I didn't believe in it um so it's a it's a reciprocal relationship definitely fantastic and um kind of like closing I mean obviously that role in particular gave you a stepping stone into the world of health tech and I understand that at the moment you are providing a wealth of expertise to health health tech companies on various aspects of of you know the the wild, the wild of health tech. Um, so, what advice in particular would you give to other doctors who were in, who are or were in your position a few years ago, who are short for time but looking really to share their knowledge and their expertise with health tech companies? What advice? would you give in order to kind of bag that first opportunity based on your own experiences mm. thus far? I think it, it can be difficult to appreciate the, the, the knowledge and the experience that we have when we're in the NHS. And it was one of the things that I, I learned the most. I think the most valuable thing I learned from this experience was learning about myself and learning that, you know, I can, I can be very comfortable in a number of hospitals, a hospital I've never worked at, and there's a clinical language, there's a discourse that we all have from being in the NHS, and that makes life so much easier when you're um, representing a health tech company, when you're trying to get a project off the ground, when you're trying to um, implement training and teaching, rolling out a, a medical device. So there's a lot that doctors can offer and it, it often, it may not be apparent until you're in another setting, um, just what your skills are, because there are so many skills that I don't think you can actually list all of them. And many of them are soft skills as well. You know, how to interact with people, how to, you know, how to um, bring people with you on the journey, which, you know, I think we do that in, in our day-to-day work in the NHS because you know all of the you know patient encounters all the things we do they're all you know they're all different journeys aren't they I think I had a real curiosity at that time and as I as I said you know I was coming to your events in the early days and various other event, events so I had I had a real curiosity for other ways of working other ways of doing things and I think that's really important rather than looking at the end result I want to to you know find a job as a CMO that wasn't what I was thinking I I was thinking I'm curious about myself what else can I do apart from being a clinician I know I can do this but can I do anything else can I do anything that's an adjunct and can I use my clinical skills in the commercial setting in a way that you know still feels nourishing and feels like you know I'm making a difference and you know helping to improve patient care and you know also the the working life of all the practitioners who deliver patient care. So that was my overriding um, motivation, I, I would say. And I think, you know, sometimes you have to be bold and be brave and, and weigh up is missing an opportunity. You know, what's the cost of missing an opportunity and what's the cost of, you know, accepting an opportunity? And, um, you know, I reduced my NHS hours quite considerably to take this on. So I was doing two jobs, but um, it was the right decision for me at that time. I think that's really fantastic advice. And I definitely would echo and encourage doctors, if you're listening to this, just to remind yourself that you are an amazing person. 
you have a huge amount of value, most of which you probably don't even recognize. And as Nushin said, the soft skills, it's all about the soft skills. We forget about the soft skills because it's not examined as much and there's less emphasis on it in medicine, but it's hugely important, especially if you are moving into private industry or the, or the general world of work, I should say, the general world of work. Um, and so it's really important that you do remain curious about who you are, what value adds you have, what you're genuinely interested in, what you're great in, what you're not so great in, but just knowing yourself, getting to know yourself, because a lot of us, we don't, we haven't really spent much time getting to know ourselves, especially as we've grown uh, within healthcare and medicine, because we just don't have the time. The reflections are quite superficial and mainly focused on the medicine, not like the, the inner, the inner. And so this is also a really great opportunity to invest in your inner and that will also help you unlock some of these opportunities that are right in front of you <laughs> in many cases. Um, and you have to be in the right headspace to see them and to seize them. Um, so I think that's that's a really awesome way to end this podcast episode. Really appreciate your time, Nushin. And if anyone wants to reach out to you, what's the best way of doing so? You can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. So Nushin Barmania on LinkedIn, get hold of her if you need any, if you, if you need to have a further conversation. Absolutely. Or whether you're a doctor, whether you're a company, uh, she is amazing. And yeah, she brings a lot of expertise to the table on the clinical and commercial side. So thank you so much for your time, Nushin. Thank you so much, Abena. It was really right, a then. pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, let's take care. Well, wow. What I forgot to add or what we both forgot to add is actually in that journey of progress, wherever you're going in your career, it's important to embrace the uncomfortable. So in Nushin's story, she talked about that she had the courage to just make a proposal, which eventually went to an amazing place. But she had to go through that really uncomfortable hurdle to even make the ask. And I would say as a doctor, if you are putting yourself in situations that make you slightly uncomfortable, but also quite geared up, that it's the right place for you to be in. And it means that you are making progress. So don't forget that in order to achieve any change in your career, you really have to be looking at stepping outside of that comfort box and moving forward. So I hope you found that really valuable. Please stay in touch with us if you have any further questions for our team or there are any companies that you feel that we should be working with, make sure to email us at team at medicfootprint.org. Don't forget we've got loads of other episodes from the past and the future, so stay tuned.